Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Lunch and Learn New School Math for Old School Adults. We're very excited um, to have Erica with us today. My name is Louise Petu. I am the Family and Community Engagement Coordinator for the Kent City Schools District, um, and this is the one way we are trying to um, help bridge the engagement gap is by offering some of these sessions um, for our busy families. So uh, when we are done today, I will go ahead and email everyone a survey. So if there's some topics that you would like to see in the future, we can go ahead and try to get those worked in. Um, or if you have feedback about the time um, and format of everything, we will also welcome that. Um, we are trying to always adapt our ways um, as our calendars adapt and our lives are adapting um, to our kids schedules and everything. Um, so we just want to bridge those lines of communication with everyone. Um, so I'm so excited that you are all joining us today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our presenter today, uh, Erica Poston. She is our K through 12 math specialist here. Um, she works with all of our K through 12 teaching staff. So she's in all the buildings in our district. She's been an educator for over 25 years. Um, she taught for 16 years at Stowe Monroe Falls School District uh, before coming here to the Kent City School District five years ago. So without further ado, I will go ahead and let Erica take it away. If you have any questions, this is pretty informal. You can either unmute yourself and ask your question or go ahead and raise your hand and we can call on you. Once again, I'm going to put that attendance link in the chat. Please fill that out and we'll be sending out surveys after today. And your feedback is so, so very valuable. Um, so if you can fill those out, we greatly appreciate it. So Erica, I will let you take it away. All right. All right. Well, thank you um, to those of you who are here and able to make it. Um, Louise and I kind of talked about doing a session like this because we know that mathematics can be sometimes a barrier for families um, in a different way than English language arts tends to be. Um, so I did title this presentation, New School Math for Old School Adults, for a reason, um, because I understand very much how what we are doing today in schools looks very different from how we learned, even though it's really not different. It's just a different way of teaching for a different purpose because we want kids to really learn and understand instead of just be able to do mathematics. So it's a little bit different. Um, my contact information is here on the first slide. Please feel free at any point um, if you have questions to always utilize that. As Louise said, my job um, is K to 12. So I am able to work with all of the schools in, in the district. I do that in many different capacities. I work with students. I work a lot with the teachers. I work with parents. So any questions that you have, um, always feel free to direct those to me. Okay, so I'm gonna start out if I can, um, if this will let me, let me see if it will let me, there we go. If you can, um, on a device, if you're there um, up at your computer or on your phone, you can either go to menti.com and put that code in, or you can use the QR code. But I would like you to put in three words that you would use to describe mathematics or that your, your child would use to describe mathematics. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a minute to do that if you don't mind. And this will generate a nice little word cloud for us. Oh, Erica, can you go back to the last slide real quick so I can scan that yeah. code one more time? Yeah, Thank absolutely. you so much. thought it would be on the presentation, but it's not. Perfect. Yeah, so I'm able to just that. scan that QR code with my phone's camera. It takes me directly to that website, and then I can go ahead and put in my answers. Yes, ma'am. Or if you don't like the QR code, you can just go to the menti.com and put that code in. But And the code will be on the next page, too, when we look at the live results. And because we don't have a ton of people in here, it might not generate a large word cloud. Um, but I kind of want to see what we get here. And the way that this works, which is kind of nice, is that the, the word that is the largest is the one that is most said. So that is positive that we have a large positive word fun in there. <laughs> um, but we do have some of the other words that typically we see overwhelming, hard, challenging, long. <laughs> 
all of those kinds of things. So, all right. I always kind of, I just like to see where you're coming from as an audience before I go into some of the changes. Um, but precisely what we see here, some of these words is exactly why we are trying to do things differently in mathematics in 2023 because we acknowledge that we've raised a generation of people who have a lot of math phobia and math anxiety. Okay, so we'll continue on here. All right, so when we ask a mathematician what mathematics is, this is what they say. The study of patterns, an aesthetic, creative, and beautiful subject. So you can see that the mathematician perspective of what mathematics is is very different than what the school perspective traditionally is about what mathematics is and what a lot of people in the general public, how they view mathematics. Mathematics is kind of like almost, it's, it's like a cool club you can be in if you were bad at math in high school, you know, it's almost like, oh, I really, you know, was terrible at geometry. Oh, I was too, you know, high five, where we would never treat reading that way, right? So it's kind of a little bit different. All right. So just out of curiosity, um, because we don't have a large audience here, but if you guys don't mind unmuting or even using the chat, just curious to know what your mathematics classes were like as a child. What kinds of things do you remember? Feel free um, to unmute and share, or like I said, put it in the chat. Um, repetitious. So what mathematics were repeated, very repetitious. repeated every year. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, yeah, I remember that. I remember actually teaching it that way at the beginning. And I see somebody says, I don't remember. <laughs> Loved math in school it was my favorite subject. That's great. That's great. You know, it is about, I would say when I speak to big, large parent um, groups, it's about a 30% positive rating with mathematics. And that's about all it is which is really sad. Um, I see same processes drilled into the head and no other options. Yes, absolutely. Um, speaking to parent groups, a lot of times what I hear also is a lot of phobia that came and they typically, what's really interesting to me is that people who have mathematics phobia, they can pinpoint exactly when it started. Like they can tell you the grade. A lot of times they can tell you exactly what the activity was. Um, times tests come up a lot for people that kind of created phobia. Okay. All right. So that's kind of my experiences too. Mine were very much, um, I never felt negative about mathematics. I always enjoyed it, but I realized as an adult learner that what I had learned was just that I was really good at repeating processes and steps and procedures that I didn't really have meaning behind a lot of what I was doing. And I never realized that because I was a straight A student in mathematics. So I thought I was doing okay. Um, and, you know, a lot of the kinds of things that you were saying, I remember a lot of the drill, um, it was about speed. Speed was something that was really um, valued. And also just kind of like what the teacher's method was, was how we had to solve the problem. That was kind of really all we had. All right. So today, the reason that things have changed is because we're acknowledging that we raised a generation of people who have a great fear of mathematics and often don't think mathematically. And there's a link here that's really kind of funny. Um, I won't play it for you just because of the time. It's about, mm, I think it's under five minutes, but it's basically, it's called Kid Snippets. And if you've never seen these, they're really cute. It's, it's basically somebody has recorded children playing and then they've put adults in an actor role with the um, dialogue of the kids playing and this one's math class, but any of, of us who've been around long enough that it actually looks all too familiar, the kind of the scenario that they go through. Okay, but today our goal is very different. All right, so our goal today is we want students to become problem solvers. We want them to collaborate with others. We want them to wonder about possibilities, be inquisitive and make sense of the mathematics without fear. And what you see in front of you, these are called the eight standards for mathematical practice. They are actually a part of our content standards. They're probably the least talked about part of our content standards, and yet they're probably the most important part of our content standards. So when you think about what mathematically proficient people do, these eight things, and these are, by the way, the kid-friendly language of them, but these are what mathematically proficient people do. So in every classroom, the goal 
is that through the lessons, these things are happening. Okay. So if you take a look at those, I have a couple of favorites. They're all really important. And a really good lesson when I'm in classrooms, all eight of these things are happening in one way or another. And some of our teachers are actually getting really, really good at um, making the kids aware of these things. And then throughout the lesson, identifying them, you know, when they have showed their thinking is logical, for example, or when they kind of didn't, you know, give up on a problem and they kept making sense of it. All right, so along with that, we have developed a math vision and mission for Kent City Schools. So this was developed, this is still kind of in a draft form. I'd like to get it out to parents um, and have you guys weigh in as well. But this is what our, we had a, a team, um, a K to 12 team that created this. And then we passed it out to all of our mathematics teachers, K through 12, and asked them to give feedback and we kind of tweaked it a little bit. But the mission that drives what we do is that mathematics educators in Kent City School District work to provide a wide variety of mathematics experiences and environments that support thinking, learning, communicating, sense making, and confidence building for all students. Okay. And then you can see our vision statement there, which goes along with that, where we envision a world where every person feels capable within mathematics, appreciates it in all its forms, they can think critically be curious, pose and solve problems, contribute positively, um, and see mathematical connections in all aspects of their life. Okay. All right. So your questions, I want to kind of open this up to your questions, but I also want to show you a couple of things that are on the next slide. These are resources. So a lot of times I get asked questions by parents. Um, one of the biggest like things I get asked are just for resources in general. And I'm going to click on some of these links just to show you what they are. So the first link will take you to a page um, that Mrs. Fetchu created for us that has, you'll see links. These are all links for thinking tasks and resources. So our elementary, um, our elementary curriculum resource is called Bridges. And Bridges has a really great math at home site that has a lot of really awesome um, activities, games that are on there. You can choose it by chapter. You can choose it by grade level. A lot of really great things that are on there for you to do at home. YouCubed at home has a lot of really awesome, fun tasks that you can do with your kids. You'll see some things I put on here, investigations, online games. There is also this website called Bedtime Math, which is really cool. It's got... Um, kind of like stories and different things that you can do with your kids, like just like reading at nighttime before bed but with mathematics. And um, there is a page from Christina Tondevold that has summer math activities for students. A couple of things I do want to point out that are on here that I would encourage you to share or watch yourselves, but share with your friends and um, other parents if you can. There is a fantastic video. It's an hour long but it's called What Happened to Math Class? Understanding the Shifts in Mathematics Teaching and How to Support Your Child's Learning. It's so worth it. Um, I would say for me, what I did the first time I listened to it was I just kind of put it on as background noise when I was getting ready in the morning or when I was doing errands or cleaning and then kind of started to pay attention to the parts that really caught my attention. Um, that might be something really helpful for you to see and just kind of, I love the way he explains it and talks to the audience. The mathematical progression videos are really great. The only thing I would um, caution you to know is that Ohio's standards have changed a bit. We all were common core standards, but we had a standards revision process that went through in 2016. So a couple of things have changed in Ohio. Specifically, um, the biggest change has to do with the standard um, algorithms for addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. So in the Common Core state standards, those are the addition, subtraction um, standard algorithm is supposed to be utilized by students with meaning, which is a huge caveat, by the end of fourth grade. In Ohio, now our standard says using an algorithm, which there are hundreds of algorithms that you know, kids could use or make sense of. So they don't have to actually have the standard US standard algorithms. Okay, so there are some really good resources here for you on that page. The other thing, exactly what I just talked about to algorithm or not to algorithm, um, 
This is a page that I have made for parents because I have so many parents asking me questions about this very topic, about um, the algorithms and should we be doing those with kids? Why or why not? And so this page that I have created gives an example. Um, well, it tells what algorithms are, kind of starts with my letter about it, and then kind of, you know, gives you the background of are they taught in schools today? Um, if, if not, why? What should the kids be doing? And along with that, there is a companion book. Now, this is going to look funny to you on your screen, but you can print it out and make it into a book, which is why it looks the way it does. But if you aren't sure what strategies to use other than the traditional algorithms, this book is full of strategies for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, okay, for you. All right, so that's a lot of me talking. Just wanted to see if we could open it up to any questions before I go any further into any resources that are included here. So if anybody has any questions, um, go ahead and either unmute or put them into the Zoom. What um, wonderful resources, Erica, They're just such a wealth of knowledge. Um, so I will be sure to send the follow-up email with the survey and then all these links to these resources that have been created. Um, that way they are right at your guys' fingertips. They will also be uploaded to our family and community engagement webpage as well. Um, so they can always be accessed there. Um, so don't worry, we'll get them to you. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that, you know, I just wanted to say that I did put on here, Ohio's learning standards um, in mathematics, there's a link there to that. They have a, just a wealth of information. Um, but I do sometimes get asked questions about what specifically in grade one should my students be able to do or should my child be able to do or what specifically should they be able to do before they leave elementary school. So the two be best resources I have linked on here. One is the critical areas of focus. They have that per grade so you can see what exactly is happening or should be happening in each of the grades. Um, the other one is really more for teachers, but I think it's really, really helpful for parents. It's the mathematics model curriculum. So basically this document has all the standards per grade level. You can pick any grade you want, K through 12, um, but it also has statements in it that kind of explain the difference between what the standards say and what they actually mean. So I think that's a really helpful document as well. The other thing that I put on here, because I want everybody to know about this, um, is about Ohio's high school mathematics pathways initiative. So in Ohio, the way that the law is for students in high school for graduation, all kids have to have four years of mathematics, up through algebra two or an equivalent is how the law reads. What has happened in Ohio is that higher education, so the universities actually came to the Department of Education and said, hey, what we're doing in high school mathematics isn't working. Can we look in, at something different? And so they have created together five pathways that count as that algebra two equivalent course. So all kids would have to take algebra and geometry, but then after that, they are supposed to be able to choose the pathways that they want to take based on what their plans are after high school. Um, the acknowledgement by the committee is that the majority of people don't need algebra two or beyond to function in their daily life or their careers. So they are they have created five different pathways that kids can choose in Kent. My understanding is that as of next year, we will be offering four of those. One is a mathematical modeling and reasoning course. It's quantitative mathematics. It's um, project-based. Um, it's really a cool course, actually. Um, one of them will be statistics. One of them will be the traditional pathway, algebra two, then into pre-calculus, calculus. calculus. Um, and then one is going to be that we will either have the computer science or the data one, I think we will be offering the computer science, but that link right there gives you good information about those pathways, why the initiative started, um, the reason behind the change, um, the change in the, in the college and careers beyond high school, and then how these pathways match with those college and careers um, that, that go beyond high school. Okay, so I think it's really an exciting, exciting thing that has is being offered to kids. And I love the fact that they 
the whole idea behind it is they're supposed to get to choose based on their interest and based on what they need for their futures instead of being tracked into a certain path for mathematics in high school. So as parents, I think that's something that um, is really exciting and great to know about. Okay. Once again, just fantastic resources. As a you know new to school parent, I'm always wondering, what does what does my child need to know? Like, what do I have to make sure that they know? And um, so those resources are great that we can just kind of see a very clear view of what they're going to be learning in each grade level. So thank you for that, including that. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm looking right now at the chat and I see um, Jocelyn has a really great question. Um, you had, I'm just going to read out loud here. So it seems like a lot of the repetition and memorization of facts was removed from our, how our students learn now. Why is this and what are the benefits and downfalls for that practice? Okay, so wow, there's that's a great question. So they aren't removed. Um, it's it's still in there. It just doesn't look the way maybe we recognize it. So for example, um, there's a lot of building in kindergarten, counting, 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 counting. And numbers struck five about how within these numbers there are other numbers. So five is a four and a one, it's a two and a three. They'll look at five as like a visual component. They will then they go up to 10, they start counting to 10 and talking about tens. First grade does some more with that work. And then first grade actually has standards um, about addition and subtraction that talk about the strategies using. Um, and adding and subtracting, such as decomposing things to make a 10, let's say. So for example, if I'm adding 27 and four, I can say seven and three makes a 10. So that would be 30. And then there's one more. So they're all embedded in there. It's just that practice of the memorization was removed um, as far as like an expectation to have them memorized in a certain amount of time. But you'll see that in the different grade levels, they say things like, um, you know, by the end of this grade level, they'll know all facts within a hundred or all of their addition within 20. So it's still in there. Um, the reason the timing was removed, there's a lot of research behind the fact that that whole practice of time tests causes a ton of mathematics anxiety and that a lot of times people are not able to fully memorize those things in a, in a way that um, actually does stick with them. It's hard for some kids to do that and that developmentally, it's better for them to learn the structure of the numbers and learn strategies for those numbers. So like if I can add and subtract all of my doubles, like I know my doubles, then I can do doubles plus one. So they learn them with um, a strategy in mind, if that makes sense. And then they, what we're working towards is automaticity. So automaticity being like um, the, the ability for them to recall those facts in a way that doesn't take a ton of brain power so that when they are in, let's say sixth grade mathematics and they have a bigger problem, all of the little facts inside of that big problem aren't tripping them up or holding them up or using all their brain power on that so that when they get to the bigger problem, they've now forgotten what they're working towards. So we are still working on automaticity. It's just that that time element is not an expectation. Although we talk with the teachers here in the district about how that is still a way to me measure automaticity, we just don't want them to put that time pressure on the students. So if a teacher wants to still do um, some sort of math fact assessment and they themselves want to time it just to kind of see where the kids are, that's okay. We just don't want to make that be the focus of what we're really doing. Hopefully that makes sense. And if you need more specific information about that, or you have more questions, let me know. And I can, um, you know, get in touch with you and we can talk about that a little bit further, but that's a really good question. Hi, so I, I had a quick question, um, or maybe it's not a quick question, but uh, um, I have a third grader and a fourth grader, and they're at drastically different points in terms of their ability to do math. Okay. But, 
um, in this household, I'm the math person. And so my wife is the English and social studies. She's a teacher at Stanton. And so um, I'm tasked with helping them with their math homework. My concern is that the way that I was taught to do certain math processes is not the same way that they're learning how to do it. And uh, is, is there, is that that to algorithm or not to algorithm? Is that the document that I can access that says, this is yeah. how they're taught how to do, say, long division, or this is how they're taught how to do certain multiplication facts or something like that. So that way, when I'm working with them in their homework, I'm helping them and in, in, in teaching them the way that they're learning in the classroom, not the way that I learned it, you know, 25 years ago or whatever it is. Absolutely. And I so sympathize with you on that because I think that is that. And, and just so you know, I, I'll just give you my um, personal opinion on this. I really try to encourage our teachers to be really mindful of the kind of homework that they are giving to kids and to make sure that it's something that parents can help with in a way that um, makes sense, you know, so that it isn't stressful. But if you go to um, the resources that are here, the first one, um, the two algorithm or not to algorithm, that, that will give you some, some background on that. But then if you go to number three, that new school math strategies for old school adults, that's the one that um, when I print out, it prints out into a book. And if you even, you know, want to, um, or actually I think you have, Ms. Fetchy, you put on the, um, sign in sheet will have their contact, right? I can even print that out to you and get that. If you let me know where your students go to school, I have actually printed copies here that I can send home and in the book form that when you print it out, it makes. And that has different strategies for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And anytime you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me too, because that's something I completely sympathize with parents on is that difference. Yes. That's great. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then anything else, you guys, honestly, I feel my philosophy is very much that we're in this together and that um, it really does take all of us to kind of understand the transitions with how things are different now than they used to be um, when, when we were in school. And actually, I very much am a believer that the way we're doing things with students now is so much better than how we were doing things um, when we were in school. I, I have those moments often when I'm realizing that I don't really still know the meaning to some of what I, why I do what I do mathematically, I just do it. Um, and how that doesn't work for a majority of people. So this is really all about the making meaning. And um, I'm always open to any questions that you have as parents. Feel free to give my contact information out to others that you may talk to or in your neighborhoods. Um, because I really do believe that, you know, you are a critical part of this, of this process. So and I thank you for taking your time to be here and even just engage in the conversation with us. Thank you so much, Ms. Mustin. Um, just such valuable information here today, such a wealth of um, knowledge and resources available to our parents. And um, thank you for extending an invitation for them to continue to reach out to you um, because that truly helps to bridge the gap. Um, just us as parents knowing what to do at home with our students. Um, so with respect to time, we'll go ahead if anyone has a question they can throw it in the chat and we can respond after there's also a link um, for a survey so we can get your feedback you can also put your questions in there and we'll be sure to get back with you um and lunch and learns will be held um the first tuesday of every month we will take um, the month of july and august off but next month keep an eye out for some internet safety tips um before we get into summer break so that flyer should be going out soon that sounds like a good one, internet safety. Yes. Um, I did want to say to any of you who are here, if you do want, um, a, like I said, like a little printed copy of that booklet, just in the, if you, if there's a space um, in the sign-in sheet, put your, your student's name um, in school or their teacher so I can just hunt them down and I'll send that home. Mm -hmm. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And um, with that, with that, we will say farewell for this lunch and learn. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Bye.